All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jackie Romersensky, and I'm helping facilitate our Workforce Crisis Task Force. So I want us to get started today and quickly go over the agenda, and then we'll do attendance and get going. So after our welcome today, we're going to take a quick look at the revisions you suggested the last time on our charter, make sure that we have captured those correctly and move forward with that. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time looking at the proposals we generated last time. Uh, and DODD and the staff have spent some time looking at those and sorting those and want to come back to you with some ideas for further discussion today. So that'll be the, the bulk of our meeting today. We'll see if we identify anything else. And by then, it'll probably be two o'clock. So that's what we're up to today. Hopefully, that's what everyone uh, agreed to. A few of our ground rules. We do request that every that all of our task force participants turn your camera on. Just makes the interaction better. Reminder that we have our mute button, although we're a pretty small group. And so you can feel fairly free to just uh, jump in and go back and forth. We'll also be monitoring the chat box. Um, anyone who's presenting always appreciates a few visual cues, the ups and downs, the thumbs to, to keep things easier on a virtual meeting. Um, the meeting is being recorded and we have all our documents um, on our shared site on the website. For those of you who need some closed captioning, a reminder that if you go to the top of your team's screen where the toolbar is and you see the three dots, if you click, click on that three dot piece, there's a moment where you can turn on live captioning and then you can have closed captioning um, on your screen to help as well. We do have guests in this meeting because this is a public meeting, but we ask that our, our guests are here to listen and not participate unless there's a specific reason that we call someone out for a piece of information. But we're glad that you're here and we, we welcome you. So let me do a quick roll call of our task force members. Um, Jason Abadili, he's here waving. Uh, Jeff Davis. I am, thank you. Kimberly Hauk. I saw her earlier. She might just be having trouble getting the mute off. Uh, Kristen Henry, are you on? I'm not sure if I saw you check in. I am. I'm on the phone today. Okay, great. Welcome. We can hear you. Um, Deborah great. Hoffine. Not today, De Jackie, I think. Okay, because I thought I saw her check in. All right, we'll keep an eye out for her. Uh, Debbie Jenkins. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Debbie. Uh, is Willie Jones on? I'm not sure if I saw him check in through the guests. There he is. Willie, are you on the call? Okay, not necessarily. Kim Kelly. I'm here. Hi, Kim. Uh, Hi. Teresa Cobelt. Here. Pete Moore. Good afternoon. Hi. Rivo Mirnix. Present. Janet Stephen. Hello. Bethany Toledo. Hi, I'm here. Gary Tong. Gary had let me know um, that he actually is in a situation where a provider didn't show up, just what we're talking about today, and he had to cover for a family. So he said he might try to pop in on the phone, but it was unlikely. So he's dealing with our search situation head on right now. Um, Nate Turner. I think Nate's on the phone. Hello. Right. There you are. Thanks, Nate. Um, Jason, Jason Olmstadt. I'm here. OK, and then um, we have the three staff support members here, myself, Nick Miller and Steve Beha. And we have um, a number of guests that um, we're able to see. If you click on the people participant, you can see names down the side. So I'm going to stop there because our time is short. Welcome everyone to the meeting again and hand off to Jeff Davis to get us started. 
Jackie, thank you. So in short order, again, my appreciation for everyone that is committed to all that have joined us on the call to your sense of urgency. And, and I think I would reinforce what we all know is that the situation demands that we all sort of hang in there and do this together. It's, it's not a unilateral department ability to uh, correct this. It is all of us together to stake steps, some immediate short term, mid term, long term. Uh, and so your commitment to this effort, um, we are more than appreciative of. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and um, try to share my screen, although I'm looking now for my button to do that. Hmm. Steven, I'm not sure if I have, there it is. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. Every time I think I have teams totally understood, I realize I've messed something up. All right. So on the screen, can you guys see with the thumbs up the Workforce Task Force Charter on the screen? Okay, great. So this should not be new, and we had it posted and sent out as well for all of you to take a peek at um, as part of the prep for this meeting. But I wanted to uh, go over this and then specifically sort of share where we made some changes from last time and hopefully it accurately reflects um, your input. So the top piece is the same and that is um, largely just logistics. We did fill in the actual website where you can go to get all the document repository where everything will be posted. Where we did make some changes was trying to adequately reflect what this group said last time around why to focus on this agenda. So what we did was try to be much more straightforward in these beginning paragraphs that it is having that adequate workforce now that is the primary issue and that there were a lot of ancillary issues that may contribute to it but these were not the primary focus. So we put those in the second paragraph. So we just tried to make sure to listen to what you said last time about there are so many important things to do, but let's not lose sight of keeping the main thing, the main thing. So we tried to make sure that the narrative matched your input and sentiment. Does anyone on the task force have any proposals or changes that you would like to recommend? Jackie, there's a request in the chat to make the text a little larger if you could. Okay. See if I can do that. Is that big enough or should I, let me see if I can go a little bigger. Jackie, it looks like you don't have your window maximized either. So we're seeing a little bit of the background of your computer desktop. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, I confess that I do that because once I maximize, I can't see who's talking. I lose your picture. So I'm going to let Steve be moderator if I'm missing something, Steve. OK. All right, so anyone have any thoughts on how we try to more adequately capture what we discussed last time and what our charge is on the focus? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to keep moving then. So in the what section, we made a few changes again to hopefully just reflect what we discussed last time. And that is one and two are the data review. And we know that's important, but we know also that the staff will be taking um, a lot of responsibility for making that happen. We spent most of our time last time talking about three and making sure that we were pursuing those actions to improve conditions. So we added the word immediate, that it wasn't just short-term and long-term, there was an immediate things that we should be identifying. And we added the word attract, that we weren't just recruiting and maintaining, but we were attracting, recruiting, and maintaining. We added the words immediate in the due dates um, as well. So that was the change we made to number three. Number four is a new addition. You guys were also all talking about while we do everything we can to find that workforce to staff the system, we may also need to recognize that if the workforce scarcity 
on some level or for some positions is something that we're going to have to deal with for quite some time, then we may have to actually adjust the system to reflect that reality. So we also put that in as something that we need to be discussing and coming up with ideas on. So those were the changes. We added the words immediate and attract to three. We added number four to call it out explicitly. And again, we added the words immediate to our due dates to reflect our conversation last time that this is not the kind of task force who works and works and puts out recommendations six months from now. It's a, a work and go, think and go, keep moving kind of group. So let Jackie, me open it up to any thoughts or ideas. Jackie, this is Teresa. And I just wonder in the new number four, yes. um, the last, if the current workforce shortage remains an ongoing scarcity, I in from my perspective, it's not an if, we should be doing that sort of regardless. So I don't know if, if those words are necessary. Um, I think okay. some of what we talked about is not, not every answer is going to be a human body. Uh, so maybe, maybe I delete the words I have highlighted right now, just because they're not the only reason to make adjustments in there. Right. That's my suggestion. Okay. I, I'm, I don't know how others feel. Let's throw it open to the group. How do you feel about that proposal? Agree. I'm game. Everybody's game. All right, I'll hit the delete button. There we go. Thank you for that proposal. Any other proposals or changes you guys would like to see made? Okay, the rest of this is truly the way we looked at it last time. We cleaned up the list because you'll remember we had an acronym wrong, but there's nothing substantive changed on the WHO. We made no substantive changes on um, governance and we made no substantive changes on roles and responsibilities. There was a conversation around the WHO where the suggestion was made that we try to recruit a few more self-advocates and that activity is underway as we speak to recruit some additional self-advocates to the team. So any other thoughts on any other section or part of the charter? Um, this is Kim Kelly, and um, I was wondering, um, one of the one of the uh, one of the places where they lost um, direct support professionals was in the jobs section, the the employment first initiative. Um, the job coaches, uh, a lot of them left because um, people lost their jobs during the pandemic, and now they're having trouble recruiting them back. Should we include um, them in in this group as well? Because they have they have another I, they have a different need. Are you talking about as far as um, having their perspective on the task force? Yes, APSE is the group that. Uh, I don't know what the words are for the acronym, but it's APSE. Thoughts from others? Well, I know that this is Pete from Opera. We we represent providers who provide employment services. So I, I think we are, we're obviously represent, when we say DSPs, we're representing across the spectrum of services that we provide. So you feel like so, you're representing that voice? So, so Pete, that, that represents people who are with disabilities, who hold jobs and require someone to come in and assist them with um, either training or um, coaching while on the job. This is Rivo. Um, they are a national organization, so I don't, you know, to, to the extent of how many of the Ohio providers are associated with them, if that's a consideration. Well, I, I think there's a group up in Summit County that represent. 
There's an Ohio chapter of APC with an E. It's the Association for People Supporting Employment First. They're they're not a trade organization. They are not a membership organization in the way that like OCA or OPERA or others would be. Um, they, and you're right, Rivo, there's a national organization and then there are state chapters. Sometimes there are youth chapters. Uh, they, they don't represent providers or um, in the way that some of the other, they, they would probably be more closely, well, yeah, just in looking at the other folks on our list, they're, they're definitely different than some of these other groups. They wouldn't represent the uh, perspective of any one group. It's made up of a pretty big cross section of people. The challenge so this is, you know, is oh. trying to figure out who should join the group so this group doesn't get too big and who might be groups that we consult with in different ways along the along the work. Yeah, this is Kim. I cut someone off who was jumping in. Go ahead. That's okay. It's just me, Kim. Um I I know we had an internal conversation about that, um, Kim. Kelly, it's funny saying the same name, but um, we were hopeful that we could outreach with others throughout the process, but continue to keep this core group small and intimate so we could have um, just some more in-depth conversations. I think that's acceptable. I just, I want to make sure that anybody that uses a provider of any sort in Ohio um, is going to be represented here, you know. Um, yeah, and I do, agree. I, and I do like the fact that we're going to add some more self advocates, but I also um, would like to add um, some other family members as well because we, using different waivers, uh, we have different home care models, uh, we have different experiences. You know, I'm IO, medically fragile, complex need, um, but and then there's people on self level one. I mean, they they all have different uses for home care services, whether it's remote monitoring or uh, or, or a live body in the room. Um, I just think we need to have some solid representation there. Okay. Well, and I think that's why we have Teresa um, as part of the group, as well as um, Kristen Henry and Gary talks. So Again, we just wanted to make sure that we kept the group small enough that people felt comfortable sharing. Okay. Any other conversations or recommendations around the charter? Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, um, uh, sorry, Jack, go ahead. No, if I can jump in. Like, we you know, this is always a balancing act and, you know, the certainly we heard from a, a number of folks originally there is a there is there are benefits to a smaller intimate group. We're not inherently opposed. I mean, the, the group, that's why we're asking the group can decide. I mean, so we're just, you know, we'll accommodate whatever the group wishes to do. It is true that we you know, based on our last conversation last week that we wanted to add, you know, at least one more self advocate. We did try Kim to 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 have a variety of of parent family advocates in different roles, but there's no firm no from us. It really is, you know, what the group wants to do. If they want to continue to expand, it's fine. It's just those of us receiving services um, have Yep. intrinsically different experiences with our home care models and how we utilize um, staff within those models. And, and, you know, definitely the self waiver is different than the IO or level one, but, but I mean, we're all having provider issues, whether it's nursing or, um, you know, homemaker personal care, or just, you know, this, what the supports that they get from the self waiver. And, and so I do think that you know, I can speak to the IO. I've been doing it for 28 years, but 
I can't really speak to the self because I've never experienced it and I cannot speak to IO. So if there's somebody on here who is living the life and I think we need the, we're the ones that are being impacted. Um, you know, certainly the ICFs are being impacted as well and nursing homes and any other, you know, group homes, these are all being impacted. But I think we need to have a, a few more people live in the life to, to help make sure that we're on target for making these things happen. Because what uh, it's been my experience that what is on paper looks great, maybe, uh, but then when you go to implement it, it's a freaking nightmare. And so we have to be sure that if I'm living the IO waiver life, I can say that's going to work for me or it's not going to work for me, but I can't speak for what's going to happen with the self people. And yes, Pete, I know you represent them, but I'm talking about independence as well. I mean, that's because that's where we're, that's where most of us are going because we can't get agency providers to support us. So, and Kim, this is Teresa, just to clarify. So I was invited as a parent and I'm living the level one life um, and the local funding life. So that's just to add that perspective. That's my role, I think, here. Perfect. So with the group, is there consensus that we should try to also at least seek one other family perspective? Or is the group comfortable with where we are now and doing other outreach activities when we have proposals? Jackie, it looks like uh, Pete Moore has his hand up. Thank you for saying that because I didn't see it. Go ahead, Pete. No, that's okay. I, I am, I am, I am not. I don't want to come across as being just, uh, you know, just we're going to work within our bubble. I see this process is we're going to. Uh, we have a network of providers at Opera that that are I'm going to reach out to after every one of these meetings to share the process and to get the feedback. I I think the networks that we each have outside of this process is is going to inform how we react and how we we move forward with any decisions that are made. So I, I think this is a, a a small and flexible, nimble group that is going to reach out to our constituents, to our networks or whatever, to get whatever feedback we have to get to bring back to whatever decisions are made. That's, I'm just sharing how I see this process going where it's not isolated, but really expansive. But it's up to each one of us to access those networks to get the feedback and from the people who are really living what 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 we're talking about here. So that that's my two cents on it. Well, I would remind you it's the first bullet under our role in the charter is to represent an audience, organization, or system role perspective, share the relative data, and there's also in there assist with obtaining diverse voices. So that is one of your key roles is to not just speak on behalf of yourself, but to go back and forth and garner more. That's still not to say we couldn't add another family representative to the group. Jackie, you, it looks I, like Nathan has his hand up now. Nathan? Okay, hopefully you all can hear me. I'm speaking from my phone account and I have a, a weird technical glitch going on, but I just want to say that I definitely appreciate the outreach to add more individuals onto the community. And I mean, I would welcome whatever the group decided in terms of adding more representation from families. I've thought that perhaps you know, on the individual side that we could consider, you know, maybe someone in, in an IO, someone in a self, someone with a level one, and someone who relies on county funds is just a thought. Um, and I'm more than willing to, as I said, I, I would support any decision that the group makes, but having uh, individual representation is, is uh, certainly needed. Um, to make sure that the voices of people receiving services are heard as we make our recommendations and try to mitigate this issue. Thanks, Nathan. And I can tell you, I know that they're working to recruit someone to hopefully join us. One or two, some people, some buddies. I can't talk today, guys. I apologize. They're re working to recruit one or two more individuals to be at our next meeting. So, um, do we want to try to recruit one more family member is the question on the table. Um, I'm not sure the, the quickest way to just make a decision on this, if it's a 
thumbs up, uh, I'm sort of neutral or a thumbs down quick vote might be faster than all of us typing something in the chat room. So if I could get a sense of you're fine with recruiting another family member, you know, it's you're fine either way, or you really would rather keep the group small and not recruit another member. So could we do the quick thumbs for the task force members? Looks like most people are either OK or you're fine on the fence. So why don't we work on trying to recruit one more family voice um, to the team for next time? All right. Perhaps perhaps who someone who's using the self waiver. OK, that would be your recommendation that that's where we look. Yeah. OK. And also, if it's possible from a rural area of the state, I think Kim and I both, you know, are from a major metropolitan and so. <laughs> Yeah, and that would make a big difference in some of the challenges, right? Makes a huge difference. OK, I've made note of that and we and of course, if anyone on the group has a recommendation for who that could potentially be, if you would forward that to myself or Kim or Steve, that would be helpful as well. If there's someone you'd want to nominate. So all right. Any other discussion on the charter itself? All right, seeing none, I would um, welcome someone to make a motion to adopt our charter. Would someone make that motion? This is Pete, I'll move. Could I please have a second for Pete's motion? This is Bethany, I second. All right, all those in favor of adopting our charter, please respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, our charter has been adopted. Thank you guys for all of your good suggestions. I think that it's a better charter now than it was when it was proposed last time. So thank you for that. We have something that's accurate that we can move forward on. The next piece of our agenda today, you'll remember when we were together last time, we generated about 30 initial ideas of things that we could maybe do to start improving um, our ability to attract, recruit, and retain the workforce. Since then, Steve and the team at DODD has been looking through those and working through those. And Steve's going to uh, begin to share the next thoughts on those lists of ideas, knowing that that's just a first set of ideas. So Steve, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jackie. I'm going to put a presentation up here for everyone to, to see. Um, so we're going to run through this relatively quick. Um, as Jackie laid out, um, all the ideas and proposals that you all came up with at the at the last meeting, we took back internally and we've developed a, an internal kind of workforce team that we've put together through people of all different divisions, uh, everybody from any type of data analytics to MDA, uh, residential resources, fiscal, uh, legal, everybody is involved in this in this internal work. So what we really establish our purpose of doing is is to support this larger group so we really do look to you for the guidance and the proposals that you want us to look at um and our thought or at least right now the structure that we've come up with is the the larger internal group meets uh periodically but really we're going to break it up into short-term project teams to tackle individual issues uh, individual proposals that you all come up with and then bring those back here to the group. So you'll see there on the on the screen kind of what we're anticipating our workflow to be is is from the proposals you all and, and recommendations that you all bring to the table. We'll take that back to the internal team. We'll interpret the ask, uh, come up with some solutions, some maybe counter proposals or proposals on how to get the work done. Um, and do some analysis on them. And then we'll bring that back to you. Uh, we'll bring it back to this task force, uh, get your feedback on it, get your consultation on it. And then based on, on um, your feedback, we'll, we'll initiate the project or, or the change or whatever the, the case may be um, that this group sees as fit. So as Jackie said, um, we, we counted up about 34 proposals uh, from this group at, from the last meeting. And so we took a look at those and we prioritized the ones that we thought uh, could 
either be at least initiated or a plan developed for within a 30 to 90 day time period. Uh, so we this this first meeting that we had, we only specifically looked at those ones, uh, trying to respond to to the immediacy that we heard from the last meeting. So we pulled those out. Uh, we identified the the small project teams that will work on those proposals and provide a response for them. And then we plan on bringing back a more formal proposal to this group at, at the next meeting on June 23rd. Um, so I think the next, yeah, the next one we're going to go through. Nick's going to kind of take over from here and go through how we grouped uh, the proposals together under some larger umbrellas uh, and some of the work we're looking at going forward. So I'll turn it over to Nick here. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> So uh, we have we have kind of eight projects that we saw from those from those 34 and sometimes the eight, uh, you know, uh, maybe one or, or like in this example, five um, uh, of the things that, that you all said um, during the last meeting. So uh, of the eight uh, projects, the first one is developing a PSA campaign, and it really sounded like you all wanted that to be multifaceted and, and um, be targeted towards different populations. So um, we uh, developing a PSA campaign is a bit of a large umbrella, but uh, that was the goal, right? From either partnering with, um, you know, health uh, or or uh, edu higher education or the Department of Ed, and trying to figure out ways in which we can attract those people to our field. Um, so that that's kind of the first one, and and I and I believe that those kind of first steps of reaching out to health and figuring out w what it is that they did and and how that process went with their uh, PSAs, trying to figure that out. So uh, that's already starting to move. Steve, if you want to go to the next slide. Nick, do you want me to interject anything on that first bullet? Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, so, you know, we've had conversations with the director of uh, the Department of Health here in Ohio, sort of piggybacking on the public service announcement that they have done throughout the COVID environment through the pandemic, and they had a structure and so, you know, we sort of initiated a conversation that did then began to bring in some of the other human service agencies to see is could the state do a big picture public service announcement trying to attract people to human service direct support. And so that is actually gaining momentum and moving forward again using their sort of infrastructure backbone, the contracts that we have, you know, assuming that we have the money, which we think we'll have the money to do that. And so you know, we're in process and uh, in progress, but it's in the early stages, but so far there is agreement and, and actually enthusiasm for the idea. Thank you, director. Steve, do you want to move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, another thing that we saw that we thought that we could um, pretty easily do over the next 30, you know, in the, in that kind of immediate actions was, um, you know, helping county boards assisting in recruit in uh, the recruiting and training of DSPs. So, um, you know, we're going to get together and, and try to find out those best practices and and make sure the county boards know that this is possible and this is available. So again, one one that, that we feel pretty comfortable um, doing quickly. Uh, Steve. Thank you. Another, Before you another, go on, I, I just have a question. How many county boards actually recruit and retain employees? Uh, direct support professionals. As, yeah, uh, is that what you mean employees? Yeah. Um, so, so, so we don't know. Um, I, I think that's one of the things that, that we're going to try to do. Um, I mean, we know that at least there are a few out there, um, but um, one so of the we things- We have 88 counties and we have more boards than that. Um, I'd like one person on the call to give me one county that actively recruits DSPs for their agencies. This is Jason. I Jason, I was going to say Jason. <laughs> we, we, have an, we have an entire department that does that. Interesting. Yeah, I, I I think we should talk to the agencies. To, I, I, I'm not demeaning or diminishing the effort, but I, I run the largest one in Northwest Ohio and everyone's recruiting like crazy. I, I don't know that the county boards are specifically and who do they tell them to go work for? We have. Yeah, well, in looking I'm sorry. I, again, I just. It's a lot of time to do the things we're already doing, so I apologize. I'm I'm going to go back on mute. I've, I've no, that's that's totally fine, Jason. Uh, I appreciate your your questions, and hopefully, uh, what we're able to gather and share with you all will uh, 
hopefully answer answer the questions that you do have. Thanks. Nick, can I uh, add yes, to that? So Jason, yeah, there are several county boards that are working with processes they have in place. I think, you know, looking with Jason is one of those. And that's part of the focus with working with provider support. Of what are the ways the county boards can assist the providers? And, you know, many times it's asking the providers in their county, what do you want us to do and what don't you want us to do? Uh, we don't want to get in the way of helping you with some of these areas with recruitment, whether it's the background checks, it's the drug screenings, it's checking the references. So that's part of it is working directly with the providers to find out what works best for them. Thank you, Willie. Steve, if you would move to the next slide. Um, so another big one that, that we saw come up uh, quite a few times uh, in the 34 was was utilization of technology. And so, uh, you know, what we what we're going to try to do is is determine ways in which we can we can better communicate, not just to uh, people receiving services, but to family members and uh, providers and ensure that that, um, you know, people know that it's out there. Right. And that and that it is beneficial. And, and so um, trying to reverse the narrative from, you know, tech can can uh, supplement DSPs to in some cases DSPs can uh, supplement technology. So um, we're, we're going to be working on that. And again, we'll have we'll have some more concrete ideas uh, or, or definitions and and uh, what we think you, you all are asking at the next meeting. Steve, thank you. Uh, two of these one um, developing an internal review process. Uh, somebody called it a lens. To ensure that um, you know we're we're not going to create um, you know an undue burden or or maybe some unintended consequences to our direct support professionals and and those that support DSPs, so creating a lens for new policies uh, for DoD to use internally, um, and then around <clears throat> excuse me, around uh, developing some some additional guidance. One Nick, of the can I stop you before you go there, Willie? You had your hand up. Um, is your have you addressed what you wanted to talk about, or do you want to hop in before? I time? have, and it's, let's get it raised or okay. lowered. Oh. Okay, so you're good? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Nick. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going. Not a problem at all. Um, so around developing guidance, um, making sure that, that um, if needed, you know, we, we want county boards to be ready and, and to know that, you know, to understand, right, what is and what isn't possible in terms of, providers utilizing their staff for emergency staffing. So we want to make sure that county boards can be prepared and, and know that that is an option. And then also trying to figure out some ways in which we can relax rules for ICFs, um, you know, to take uh, take advantage of, of that economy of scale that somebody said. I see Teresa raised her hand. Yeah. And now I have to think of how to unmute myself, thanks. <laughs> um, so I'm just, I, I guess when we named these last week, I didn't, I, I love that you all went for it and organized and are taking action. I think this one in particular raises all kinds of alarms and red flags for me, but I also, I think probably for our system. So I don't, I don't know, Nick or Steve, when you say like you're starting to work on or that there are teams dedicated to, if I just don't, can you say more about Yes. Does yeah. that mean like this group has endorsed this and is moving forward with it? Because I, I don't I think we want to have more discussion. No, definitely. Uh, we, we, we haven't made any decisions internally. What what uh, we tried to do is just look at what uh, what those 34 were and try to decide, you know, if if we were going to do these things, kind of this is what it would look like. Right. Or this is how we would support. So um, when when I talk about like, for example, for that one, uh, developing guidance, um, really, it would be, hey, if we were going to develop guidance, you know, that that would relax rules for larger ICFs, this is what it would look like. And we would just present the idea to you all. And um, the goal would be for, for you all to uh, either either support or or, or reject the um, the option. So these projects aren't cool. You've said it once. Thank you so much. We're going on and doing it. Um, it's it really just these are some things that we can either check yes or no kind of a, off the list um, in, in those immediate and short term. Uh, Willie, I'm, I'm sorry, I see. Sorry, Teresa, I didn't mean to cut you off if you were going to say something. Okay. Willie, I see your hands raised. Yes. So and I want to make sure uh, 
Teresa and Lyme, I think the one to access county board staff for emergency staffing is definitely an important area of guidance. Uh, I know we have some superintendents who are being very proactive. They're looking at if our providers don't have any staff and we have SSAs that are available, we want to know that we were able to do that and do it without any negative consequences. And I have to applaud those superintendents who are thinking that far ahead of saying, you know, we want to make sure our people are safe and we want to be able to utilize our county board staff if that is what's needed in an emergency situation. I think Jeff wants in too. Yeah, back to Teresa's point, we want to make, a, we're assuming that this group will delve into really substantive discussions on some of these suggestions that merit it. Some are easy, some will be controversial, all of it, but that's, you know, that is part, I think, of what this group is for. So just to be clear, we're all we all know that there's not like full consensus on all these ideas that we generated ideas last time. Now we're trying to start processing what could or couldn't happen. And that's where we're at today. Well said, thank you, Jackie. Uh, Steve, would you mind moving to the next slide for me? Another one that, that we saw was uh, defining, you know, a DSP and HPC. I know that this will probably lead into a much bigger thing that um, is an immediate or, or short term, but we thought that at the very least we could we could finish this ask relatively quickly so that um, you know this this workforce crisis task force could um, kind of decide if if you know going down that path is where we want to go. So um, going to be going to be doing that, and then another thing that we've already started doing is you know the independent provider recruitment you know simplification. So. Um, you know, waiving either whether it's waiving fees or making the process easier, uh, less burdensome. Um, we've already we've already kind of gotten a kickstart on that. Right. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I'll follow up a little bit if I can. And I'll take my hand down however I do that. So, uh, you know, we had some good suggestions from Kim, Kelly and, and a couple of other family members. You know, where does our certification process perhaps present a barrier, particularly in situations where, you know, families have done the recruiting and they want their in need and want to get someone started as soon as possible. So, you know, we've tr we have, we've started and created a, a sort of um, mailbox of sorts, but that allows families to notify us, you know, if they have recruited uh, an independent provider and they really do want need that independent provider to start as soon as possible so that we can, you know, to prioritize some efforts to accommodate that through our certification process if it's a new provider. And then with respect to uh, independent provider initial certification fees, and this is time limited we're looking at, but we are looking at taking another stab at that for a period of time to, uh, waive the initial certification fee for independent providers. We did that, if you remember, back during calendar year 2020 during the pandemic, the situation, you know, well merits a similar consideration. Again, time limited, but but reflective of the need out there. And I, I say all this in, in very much remembering uh, the conversation last week uh, and Debbie brought it up. This you know, it has to be a balance. We can't tilt the scale as much. Uh, we don't want to tilt the scale, but uh, in total favor of independent providers and have unintended consequences. But there are a couple of things we think we can do. And I'm not sure if now is the right time to bring it up or or if later. But Kim also in the chat box has um, noted that CMS has decided that the internet is utility, and as a result, the state can no longer pay for it as of July one. And she's wondering if that will have an impact on promoting remote supports for those not wanting a DSP. I don't know if that's a question we need to explore or if it's something we want to talk about now. Kim, please add anything you want to add. No, I'm just thinking, you know, because like Teresa was saying, you know, that she doesn't necessarily want a person in, in the home. And, and I understand that. And there's a lot of people that um, I know who are using remote supports, whether it's Alexa or an actual camera in the house to help them out. 
um, but they do require internet. And um, I guess the waivers aren't going to be allowed to pay for it anymore. And so this is uh, creating quite a stir uh, with some of these self advocates. And I'm just wondering with the previous slide where you talked about, you know, trying to promote remote supports, which I think is great because it's it's really going to be help a lot of people if they understand the technology and how to use it. But are they also going to have to, you know, pony up 50, 60 bucks for internet to make it work? Well, it's too premature to say exactly what is going to happen just yet, but it's certainly that the decision from CMS is not going to help. That's clear in the sense that we want to go in the complete opposite direction uh, <laughs> with some urgency, but we're going to have to figure it out. Okay. And so, you know, that's actively what what Debbie Hoffine and team are doing, and we'll do that in concert with our county partners and everybody. But it's not going to stop us from marching ahead, but it sure is not timely. Yeah. That'll Thank work. you. <laughs> Teresa, I think um, I think your hands up. Yeah, uh, Jeff, you had mentioned the tilting of the scales toward independent providers and I whether, I don't know how hard an ask this is. I was curious to know how many people, what the use of independent providers looks like. So for example, the person that we use as an independent provider would never be an agency provider. We're not competing with an agency. She provides respite on weekends, holidays over the summer because she's a college student, for example. Um, and Anyway, there's more to that story, but so I don't, in that way, I'm just curious what the use of independent providers looks like throughout the state, um, if that could be a data point that um, might inform our conversation at some point. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's one that we can we can certainly chat about now, Teresa, or, or find the creative ways that this group's going to talk offline in between meetings. One of the reasons that that I particularly ask Rivo Mernix to join, you know, our our Rivo to be active on this task force is just that. What data do we need? How can data help us? And so forth and so on. So you can either have that conversation, Rivo and Teresa, or we can do it now, whatever you wish. But we can try and figure that out. Although off the cuff, I'm not exactly I'm not exactly sure how I would picture that, but. So, so I'm going to vote for offline and figure that out and maybe come up with some data because I'm watching the clock. Yeah. That's right with you guys. Um, Nathan had a point question. His hand is up and then I know Nick has more to present. Nathan. Hello. Can yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Sorry about that. Just really quick. I think there's a potential to collaborate with the federal government, especially like the FCC and uh, like for low income broadband access and really um, reaching out and providing collaborative information in a toolkit for providers and families to use in response to the CMS decision. Okay, good point. All right, Nick, do you want to keep going? Uh, yep, I can I can do that, Steve, if you want to move on. This is the last one, so um, and I think this is relatively straightforward, but um, just developing some, some possibilities um, for what we can use the ARPA funds for for a DSP package. So I'm um, going to just try to figure out what what we could do and, and you know, what maybe uh, different things could look like. Um, so that 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 I think is, is the last of the eight, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, Steve. Um, so that's the last of the eight projects. So I'll throw it back over to you to kind of talk about timelines. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, so I kind of outlined at the beginning what our kind of internal work process was going to look like is basically getting the information from you all, uh, taking it back internally. And we're going to do this as, as often as we possibly can is to develop some proposals for you to respond to uh, to some of the work. So we had our, our first um, kind of joint meeting around uh, the, the task force suggestions uh, earlier this month. Uh, today's our overview presentation. Uh, we're, we are convening the small uh, project teams in between now and June 18th, where we'll kind of reconvene, put together a more formal proposal and bring that back to you all on the 23rd uh, to get your feedback and um, consultation on. 
So that's the timeline that we are looking at for this. And, and we kind of, uh, I think Jackie alluded to it earlier, this is going to be a working group. So as more suggestions come up, as more recommendations come up, we're going to try to keep this process going so that we can get you all timely information to react to. Um, and, and do know that these are just the ones that we pulled out that we thought we could at least get some initial thoughts around rather quickly. We know that there are larger issues, long-term um, policy changes and things like that that will need to be tackled, but we just wanted to try to get started with something to um, to, to get the cogs moving on some of these other projects that we think can be done quickly, uh, knowing that the, the bigger bigger issues, bigger topics are yet to come. So just wanted to give that. So I know there's been questions throughout, but if anybody has any questions about how we're tackling these these things or our, our structure of how to do it, I'm happy to take those. Or Jackie, if you want to. And it looks like Pete has his hand up. Thank you. And I, I want to start by saying I appreciate the effort for the internal department team to identify some areas uh, to start to work on. It is appreciated. I I didn't know my I have a couple of things to say. One's a question is are we at a point where we'd like feedback from us between now and the 18th regarding some of these? I don't know if you could send them out via email and we can work with our networks to give some feedback on each one of these for your consideration for the 18th as you put together more formal proposals. So that's a question. And I'd, I'd like to add a ninth or at least have a, a, a ninth uh, piece considered. I think uh, we need to identify some immediate hot spots across the state, either per provider or per county hot spots. Um, so we'd have to define what a hot spot means. Does that mean we're at we're at 50 percent of our staff that we're supposed to have? We'd have to define it. But then we can create a. Um, a uh, response team or whatever we want to call it. We can even give it a cool name if we wanted to. But I, I think that what we have to do, you know, to Jason's point earlier, I think what Jason's bring up, that, you know, people have been recruiting, 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 and they still can't get over the hump. Um, so where are the hot spots? Where are services in danger, right? Or where are uh, providers on the brink of closing their doors? or having to move people to more bigger congregate settings or whatever else. I think we have to identify those. We have to understand what's happening and we have to respond. So I'd like to include this identification of hotspots and resources, maybe ARPA money, maybe county board funds, whatever it is to address those hotspots because we do have not everyone's in a in a workforce emergency. That's true, but there are many who are. So we do we really understand and know who those people are and how are we truly helping them? So that's what I would like to propose for a ninth discussion point um, for this group. Okay. Captured that. I see people nodding. Is that a good thing to put on the action item list that we'll pursue? Okay. Yeah, that's not totally un you know different from you know what we did in the midst of the virus when we had response teams. I mean, it's it's different, obviously, and well, there are similarities in the way that one could structure that and you know and pull in collective support. Yeah, and I I appreciate that, and that's what I had in mind, director, when in, in thinking about this. But also, you know, when we talk about guidance, for example, for how county boards could use their SSAs to fill gaps. Maybe we just have to do that in a targeted fashion uh, rather than on a widespread basis. I don't know that for sure, but I think it's worth trying to see where the hotspots are and trying to fill those gaps. And, and to that point, Pete, I, I think you make a, a really important point about where we can short term versus medium term, because I'll look at a county board, even a large county board. Let's say there's a dozen, I'm gonna make up a number, a dozen SSAs. Well, if you've got 30 providers and one provider in it itself has 100 openings. It, it's unfair to even ask the county board to help. What does that even mean? What you're not even putting a dent in the overall problem in that area. The county boards weren't built to chip in when you've got hundreds and hundreds of full time positions open just in one out of dozens of agencies. 
it, this is, to your point, if you can identify where this is happening, you can eliminate probably six of the nine suggestions because they won't help. Then we can focus on the three that can. Um, the, ladies and gentlemen, this is, we don't have time. We don't have five days to think through this. Okay. Debbie, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think uh, Jason probably made my point for me um, that we feel like this is very urgent. I know our members are talking about it. They're they're at the point where they just don't know what to do. And I think we've got to um, figure out some, th some ways to be able to help them. One of the things I think that we also need to do is determine what kind of data we need to look at. Um, so when Pete was talking about the defining the hotspots, maybe what we're doing is looking at what counties do have providers giving 30 day notices. You know, where where are we seeing that um, people are losing their services? So I would also like to add, and I think this is something we can do in a very short term is determining what type of data we need to look at to determine where the major areas are and, and what we can do to actually help in those areas um, because I'll be honest, I know we're meeting every two weeks and I'm grateful for that. I really do appreciate it. Um, but if the, if this meeting was spent reviewing what you guys are talking about internally and the next meeting is gonna be spent, you guys giving us updates on what you're doing internally, I'm not sure we're really truly getting to the point where we're actually making a dent or helping folks. Um, so I just wonder if there's maybe other things that we all can be doing to help you out so that it's not just the department having to do these things. Um, but maybe we can all get together and have a smaller group and talk about data or talk about, you know, things that we think that could help um, and have further discussions in between the time that we're meeting as a as a larger group. Yeah, I want to jump in. You know, it was never intended to this to right. be a meeting dominated effort. That's not not fair. And I don't think that anybody I don't think any of us at the department intended that. The meetings are not. I mean, there's. We should be talking about this continually and always, and we don't have to wait on a meeting to do something. So I'm with you all the way. And so, you know, this today was just an attempt to say we we're responding to what was suggested last week. Right. Oh, if we have other stuff we want to do now, then absolutely we're game. We've already jumped on some things that we can do. But clearly some of this is a local provider by provider effort. So yeah, we don't have to wait till next week. And, and if people are thinking that, I wish you would not. We've never said that. The meetings are just a structure to have, you know, what will ultimately be some very difficult discussions on some longer term systemic issues because of permanent scarcity. But things that we can do now, we're wide open. It's a phone call away or a team's away or whatever we want to do. So if you want to, we want to set a stage now, this very moment, for the very next conversation, 20 minutes from now, we're all game. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, I would like to volunteer to be part of a group to look at the data to identify the hotspots. Um, so we can pull a group together and come up with by the end of the week for sure what what a hot spot looks like I got a text from we, someone. we want regional teams it took us not very long to institute regional efforts you know during the pandemic i have to believe we can start something like that right away you know other so rivo is on the phone i think rivo steve whoever you need you know obviously we probably have some of the best access to data although we're not necessarily going to know 30 day no, we're not going to know everything, so we're going to need our county partners and our provider partners, to, you know, to join us. So Pete's agreed to help Rivo. Is there anyone else who would want to be part of defining that hotspot data? We knew Debbie. That was a good I'd be one. happy to. Debbie and Jason. And then uh, I'm assuming if those guys get meeting and realize they need someone else here, they could reach out and whoever we reach out to, we all agree will help, correct? Is that a fair assumption? I see people nodding. Okay. Can I throw in there? I, I don't, I, I'm just as part of the hotspot data that you're looking at. Would it be possible to get from um, DODD 
ICF admissions over the last year. So have we seen, to Kim's point in the chat, kind of have we seen ICF admissions go up um, compared to the same period over the year before, something along those lines? I know I had heard that anecdotally. Um, I've heard it on a number of calls, and I just wonder if that could be another of the um, data points that we look at. Well, uh, Teresa, it's not only ICFs, but it's nursing homes as well. Um, my recommendation would also to get um, county representation because each of the county boards has a provider liaison designated, and I think they'll be critical um, to the hotspot discussion. Lori, Lori Stamp uh, um, texted me. She's listening in and volunteered to also be part of the group. Okay, thank you. I'll put. I'll capture that. All right, so we will all keep, we're going to be in this for the long term as a group, and we'll all keep modifying and figuring out the best ways to work with each other. We had established two meetings a month. I think the idea was that the one hour meeting could be a space where as things are being generated, we quickly react, we decide if something's working, not working, give suggestions, and the longer two hour meeting, we could spend more time truly generating or um, talking about something that needs more in depth. And then to the director's point, it doesn't mean there's lots of other stuff going on in between. And if we keep working and that format isn't cutting it, I don't think anyone here isn't willing to say that's not working. We got to shift to a different format, a different time frame, et cetera. But that was at least the initial thought, the one hour check-ins when we have stuff we worked on from the two hour meetings, if you will, and the in-between meetings, and we go over it and we keep moving. And then the two hours for the more in-depth design meetings, if you will. So that was the thought process. We welcome any other suggestions in the meantime, if that's just a flawed concept to start with. And I have action items from today's uh, meeting. Finish recruitment of the self-advocate to the team. Recruit another family representative to the team hopefully with experience in the self waiver from a rural area. Um, Nick and Steve are gonna send out the ideas in more detail that they talked about today and seek all of your feedback prior to June 18th. The team is immediately gonna begin working on what could, how could we define a quote hotspot and then begin identifying where those are in Ohio. We also um, have a request for perhaps putting a small group together to start thinking about what data needs do we have in the long term, which is one of our deliverables. So what data needs should we be pursuing immediate, short term, long term? And one of the data points you guys brought up beyond the hotspots was what are the trends from the ICFs and the nursing homes? And does that tell us anything? So those are the current things I have on the action item log. Did I miss anything? I just noticed in the chat, Bethany had put that she'd be interested in working on the DSP package, which was something, Bethany, that I brought up on that last call. So I'm happy to shoot out if people want to talk about that between now and the next meeting. Um, I can just try and set something up to at least start thinking and talking about that. I, who's talking? I apologize. Teresa, I'm sorry. I usually I say you, first but, uh, and then I, I forget. I see on my screen and I didn't want to make an assumption. You know yeah. how that goes. It was Teresa. Okay. I'll just probably, I'm going to assume everybody wants to be a part of the conversation. <laughs> I'll just send it out and respond if you want to be, and we don't need to take a roll call. I also just wanted to quickly, if anybody knows about that CMS decision and broadband, the only thing I'm aware of is Yoast suing Google to try and get it declared as a public utility, which is really different than CMS saying it's a public utility. So if I'm missing something, somebody tell me where it is. No, this was in response to our waiver renewals and CMS uh, made that decision for us here in Ohio. So whether it is broader than that, I do not. I have to assume it's consistent, Teresa, but I will see if we can get more data and share it with you. Yeah. And is there anyone else that, that you want RIVO that you want RIVO to, to reach out to on the on the data collection effort? Anyone else that didn't raise their hand? Jason, I we get you. Jason. Yeah. 
without Teresa Good. Okay, and then as Rivo thinks about it, if he wants to recruit one of you, he'll recruit you. Or you it's, might be vol you might be volunteered, as they say. Into the that hasn't raised their hand. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, all right. Thank you guys very much. We've run a little late today, but um, boy, you can just tell how much everyone cares about this issue. So we'll just keep working. And let me throw it back to Jeff for any final comment. No, thank you. I think I talked a lot again, although I promised myself I would not. But yes, we're. I appreciate this, and um, we'll get started in these immediate things. Just for my notes, here's a really trivial question. I have Tom and Michelle as guests, but no last name. So um, if you could even just put in the chat box what your full name is, that would be helpful for me for the notes. All right, I don't have anything else. We are next scheduled to meet formally um, on June 23rd. And obviously we've already given ourselves a lot of assignments between now and then. And as the director said, if anyone else has something else that they think, wow, we should jump on between now and then, please don't feel like you have to wait formally for the next meeting, feed it into the hopper and we'll figure out the way to keep moving. Thank you, Michelle and Tom for your chat box. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I think we're adjourned for the day. Thank you very much.